I have a student, we'll call him George, broke up with his partner many years. We'll call her Martha. And he went to talk to a Dharma teacher about this. And the advice she gave was that you have to remember that on an ultimate level there is no George and there is no Martha. Never was. And he realized it was bad advice to say that there's nobody there means that there's nobody responsible, and that the people who are affected by your actions don't really exist, so it doesn't matter what you do. That kind of thinking is the refuge of people who don't like responsibility, don't like to think there are consequences to their actions. The question he had for me, though, was why would the Buddha teach such a thing that on an ultimate level there are no beings? And my response was the Buddha never taught anything like that. To begin with, he never said that some of his teachings were ultimate truths and others were only conventional truths. The terms that they use, like paramata sacha or samuti sacha, don't exist in the suttas. And he never said that there are no beings. Again, the terms for no being, nisato or nijiwo, also don't exist in the suttas. When asked what a being was, he said very clearly, beings are their attachments. He wouldn't define what you are, but he says you are defining yourself. You're creating an identity. And you go into it. This is the process of becoming, which, as he said, happens an awful lot. That's why we're suffering. You create an identity, that's becoming, and then you go into it, that's birth. And the process can go on indefinitely, because we get so fascinated with the becomings that we create. The Buddha's images of little children bu building what he called mud houses. You can have an image of the kids by a mud puddle, and taking the mud and making little houses. And he says, as long as they're fascinated with them, they keep playing with them, keep making them. It's our attachment to these things that we create. A Western example would be the story of Pygmalion, who created a sculpture of a beautiful woman and then fell in love with the sculpture, forgetting that he'd created it to begin with. But this process is very uncertain and very unstable because it's directed by our desires. And our desires can go in any direction. As the Buddha said, the mind is so quick to change directions that there's no, there's no image, no simile that's adequate for how quickly it can change. And it's capable of all kinds of things. So there are beings, but beings are very unstable, very changeable. In fact, this is the way the Buddha has you deal with grief of separation, either the death of a loved one or the death of love. You just realize how changeable you are, how changeable the other person is, and how universal this pattern is. It applies to everything, everybody. That enables your grief to be transformed into compassion. You think about everybody's suffering. So why pile suffering on other people? Why pile extra suffering on yourself, since relationships are so much marked by suffering? That's the first stage. Ultimately, the Buddha says you want to go from what he calls householder grief, the grief of not getting what you want, to renunciate grief, the grief that there is such a thing as nirvana and you're not there yet that he calls a, a pain not of the flesh. And it's something we actively cultivate. But we have to go through this step of compassion first, thinking of all beings and how much they're suffering. How many people are suffering separation right now, right now, right now? That gives rise to a sense of sangwega, 
realizing as long as you continue getting fascinated with your mud houses. There's going to be suffering. They're going to be washed away. So that is what makes you want to get out. And this is where the Buddha's teachings on not-self come in. He says you have to learn how to overcome your fascination with, with those mud houses. You see, they're made of nothing but the aggregates, form, feelings, perceptions, mental fabrications, acts of consciousness, coming and going, coming and going. And coming and going in all kinds of zigzags. You want to learn how to see that these are really not worth getting involved with. This is a, he's, he represents this by little children suddenly getting sick and tired of their mud houses, realizing, realizing it's nothing but mud, and then destroying them. So we're trying to take apart our identity that we've created as beings and see that there's nothing worthwhile there. Another image that's used in the canon is of a chariot. And you take the chariot apart, and when everything's been taken apart, there's no more chariot. Now, this image is sometimes used to say, well, the Nerva was a chariot, but that's obviously not true. There were chariots. And as long as you're fascinated with chariots, you put them together. When you begin to realize that they're going to keep falling apart, falling apart. That they would bring nothing but suffering. That's when you take them apart and say, there's nothing left anymore. It's not that you're destroying the being that you created. You're just letting it run out on its own, and you don't create anything new. Now you might think of the image of sand castles at the edge of the ocean. We keep building sand castles, and the waves come in and wash them away. We build another one and wash it away. You know, we keep at it. We seem to never get enough. And the Buddha, on the night of his awakening, looked around and saw a being suffering from just this problem. He realized he himself had been suffering for long periods of time, building these houses. That's why after his awakening he said he'd been searching for the house builder. And now the house builder was seen. And because the mind had been engaged in dismantling, that's the meaning of the word we sankara. It's the opposite of sankara. Sankara, you put things together. We sankara, you take them apart. He realized it's not worth doing anymore. This is why we say that insight is a value judgment as to what's worth doing and what's not. These identities that we take on, they're not worth it. And when you've trained the identity well, now we do use a sense of self, the sense of self that can meditate, the sense of self that can practice generosity, practice virtue, that kind of self we need as long as the path hasn't yet been developed. We have the sense of competence, confidence that we can do it, and competence that we can do it. The sense of responsibility that if we don't do it, it's not going to get done, so we've got to roll up our sleeves and do it ourselves. And the sense that we're going to benefit from this. Now you notice that the Buddha never says what's left afterwards. You know, if he had said there were no beings, you'd wonder, well, why does he keep saying that the arahant after death cannot be described as being or existing or not existing or both or neither? I mean, if the being didn't exist to begin with, then nirvana wouldn't make any difference. Then there'd be no existence. But the Buddha was very careful to say, no, you can't describe the arahant. The arahant is beyond description because beings are defined by their desires. But there's no desire, and so you're undefined. This relates to the Buddhist statement that when you take on an identity, you take on an obsession or an attachment to the aggregates, you're limiting yourself. 
the images for the people who are not doing that are limit, images of no limitations at all, as vast and as fathomable as the ocean. Like a fire that's gone out. In those days, when a fire went out, it was assumed to be vast. It was, became an element. And so what you are, who, who is the you who's creating these identities, the Buddha never says. And that's one of those questions he has you put aside. But he does have you know that the state that comes when you stop being fascinated with this house building, building these sand castles, building these mud houses, is a state of ultimate happiness. In fact, when the Buddha uses the word Bharamata, ultimate, it's to describe nirvana. It's not a language of certain truths that are more ultimate than others. After all, he says the arahant knows the limitations of languages, which are all conventions. Even the Buddhist language of, of the aggregates is a series of conventions. When you use these conventions to attain something that's ultimate. So we're now being asked to content ourselves with an ultimate description of things. We're trying to find, and the Buddha promises, that if we follow the path, there's going to be an ultimate happiness. That's not dependent on any conditions at all. And that's his ultimate cure for grief. Because that renunciate grief is not meant to just sit there. It's meant to motivate you. You realize that you're suffering, and there's more to be done. And you focus on doing it, and it's in the doing it that renunciant grief turns into renunciant joy, renunciant equanimity. It's something that can't be contained in any little house. The Buddha said while he was alive, he dwelled with unrestricted awareness. And it was awareness that wasn't associated with the six sense spheres at all. So when the six sense spheres passed away, that awareness remained. If you were to talk in terms of space and time. But it's beyond even space and time. Which is why it can't be described. But it can be found.